Today is going to be a talk about emotional ergonomics, what it means to me to design in cyberspace. And this is going to be a little bit of a different one. It's not quite so NFT, DAO, Web3 focused, but I do think that it connects and is something really important for all of us UI, UX designers in the room to consider and developers to really start to think about how do you design experiences inside of Web3 that are super usable, that are super emotional, that are really relevant to people. And so a little bit about myself. I'm an interaction designer at we3.co um, and a systems designer at IDEO. And what that meant is that my work is spanned everything from the original brands for Good & Gather at Target um, to some of the work around branding for Lens to um, Astroport as well as the Refi Orb. So if you've seen any of these projects today, come talk to us. Happy to chat where these come from and what our process looks like. But throughout Web3, throughout Web2, throughout even not digital products, something that I keep coming back to time and time again every time I'm thinking about design, whether it's cyberspace or physical products, is Great design connects function with feelings. Something that you're trying to do out in the world, something that you're trying to get your users to do, whether that's payment, whether that's to buy an NFT, whether that's to save the penguins, there are feelings attached to those things, and those aren't just things that you feel inside your body, those are things that are super visceral in the way that you're interacting with your screen, in the way that you're interacting with objects, in the way that you're interacting with the rest of the world. And so, does anyone remember back when search engines looked like this? Okay, yes, this is, this is a little bit back in the day. There's a reason why this search engine did not take off. Why? Because you're trying to find something, and I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at so much chaos. I'm like, what, what am I supposed to input? Where am I supposed to put something in? My hunch for why Google actually became one of the greatest search engines in the world, not necessarily because it was first to market, but it was because they took that insight of this is a whole bunch of chaos. And what our user is trying to do is feel like they are looking for something and they are able to find it very, very quickly and simply. And that is what you get in the very, very first version of the Google homepage, 1999. Not so much has changed. And so when we look at this, this is sort of my understanding of what the heck emotional ergonomics are and what they're doing in cyberspace is how you feel about the screens that you're seeing. And before we dive into what emotional ergonomics are, perhaps it's a little bit helpful to go through and think about where else ergonomics shows up in our lives. So how many people have ever come across this chair or sat in this chair? Okay, you've sat in it. Does anyone know what this chair is? You can just shout it out. I'll read your list. Eames Herman Miller, it is $799, very expensive chair. They are usually found in art museum cafes, and the reason why is because this chair is incredibly uncomfortable to sit in about 15 minutes in. And the reason for that is because it is not meant to be physically ergonomic. It's meant to be something that you sit in and you feel super uncomfortable after a little bit of time, so you keep it moving. They're found in a lot of public spaces that are meant to look nice, but they are not designed for comfort. And so in the industrial era, in the industrial age, physical ergonomics was something that was super important in productivity, in economics, in getting people to behave and move in a certain way. And that showed up mainly in the format of handles. When factory workers were working with physical interfaces, there was this moment where it behooved the company to give you something that was a little bit easier to work with with your body so that you could work more hours, so that you could spend more time being productive. Now, when we move into the information age, we start to think about mental ergonomics. It's not just in your body anymore. It's not just moving handles. It's not just sitting into something. It's about how you're able to understand and have information transferred to you in the quickest and fastest way possible. So we're going to do a little bit of an experiment here. I want you to get ready to look at the next slide. And when you fall for it, I'm not even going to say if because I'm pretty sure it's a when situation. When you fall for it, raise your hands. Get ready. Here we go. Three, two, one. Uh, okay, all right, all right. Yes, yes, yes. You will read this first, and this, and then this one, and you will read this one last. You fell for it because by design, what UI UX designers, generally designers, are doing is they're very, very, very good at understanding how do I make something mentally ergonomic for you? And that's what we've had in our age of screens, in our age of things that are a little bit more static, and in our age of advertising. And so now this question of like, what the heck are emotional ergonomics and what does it mean to start designing for them in cyberspace is this. When you see something like this, what is the feeling that you get? Shout it out. 
Anxiety, wow, amazing, perfect. Didn't even have to set you up for that one. Everyone, most people say anxiety. And when you are interacting with your phone, when you are looking at, when you're literally bowing to your phone every single day, and that feeling that you have of anxiety comes up over and over again, or that feeling of dopamine rush comes up because you're doing infinite stroll, because you're doing pull down to release, those are feelings that have no body. They are stuck in your screen and you're feeling those things inside and it eventually makes the internet a very not ergonomic place to be. And so one of my favorite things that I've started to see in um, new age interaction design perhaps is this phenomenon of going beyond the device. It's saying instead of just looking into your device and designing all of your interactions in there, you have this ability now to think about your device as an actual object to interact with. So if you wanna go to humanrecordplayer.com or scan this QR code, you can try it out right now, but I'm gonna try it here. We'll see if this actually works. But Weezer dropped their latest album in Audio is a little bit terrible. Let's save this link to do later. But what you end up having to do is to play this record, you have to physically move your phone as if you, the human being, are a record player. And I call this category of new interaction design dancing with your devices. And I think what it does is it takes that experience of something that's just solely inside your screen, something that isn't really affecting your body at all, into something that you have to physically move. You have to physically interact. You have to physically feel the results of your interactions. And so something very interesting, I think, started happening in the 80s, up until today, is that our physical objects very rapidly started to disappear into the screen. Everything that we had that we could interact with started to go into the desktop. Our memories, our calendars, our books, our, I don't know how sunglasses made it in there, but we'll, we'll, we'll give that one a go. Um, everything starts to be compressed and compiled into the screen. And so you might ask yourself this question now, what else is there left to put into the screen? And with the dawn of the metaverse, perhaps what we realize is that it's really not a matter of putting more things into the screen. We're at this moment in time where we're actually looking through the screen and augmenting reality through it. And what does that mean? It starts to see a moment where we're not necessarily designing just for our realities that are built around us, we're now also designing for realities that are augmented, realities that are altered. And the feelings that people have when there's a break in reality is often very, very uncomfortable. So I love the Gartner hype curve. Whenever this drops, it's like basically my equivalent of the Super Bowl. I think it is the Super Bowl for designers. Um, back in 2016, augmented reality was here in the trough of disillusionment. What happens when something is in the trough of disillusionment? It usually means that a lot of startups in that space start to close down because they can't figure out how to make it into the plateau of productivity. Who remembers what Snapchat was doing in 2016? Lenses. Most of you have forgotten and you would not be blamed for that because Snap's tacticals were a thing in 2016 and most people looked at this and rolled their eyes again back in the trough of disillusionment, right? But when we look at what happened to augmented reality, when we thought about it as, yeah, it was maybe an eye roll, it was maybe kind of a joke, when we look at the hype curve for 2022, augmented reality isn't even on this graph. Over the course of Seven years, can I do math? Seven years. Augmented reality went from trial to disillusionment, disillusionment into not even plateau of productivity. Because I would say if you were to figure out what is the best camera company out there right now, I would make the argument that it's Snapchat. The reason why Snapcam, maybe we could pause, pause it, is the best camera out there right now is because it's moved into cameras being a capture of reality to cameras now augmenting reality. And that moment of going from capture to augmentation means that the feelings that we have about reality are perhaps a little funky. Is what you're seeing real or not? And how do we design for grounded truth and grounded reality? So I want you to take a moment right now. To close your eyes. I'm not gonna do anything weird to you, I promise. Close your eyes and really take a moment to think about what you value. What is it that you value? Let an image come up, let a feeling come up, let a memory come up. All right, open your eyes. Did anyone say money? It's fine if you did, literally, literally a store of value. Did anyone say NFTs? That's okay too, that's totally fine, no judgment here. Who said your family? Mm -hmm. Who said your job, your career, your sense of purpose in life? 
Who said a physical object? Is there a family heirloom or something that's there? The things that you value are things that you have feelings for, and they're typically things that you want to protect. And so if you're introducing something new, if you're introducing a new function, a new premise of a new technology into a space, you need to design feelings into what you're doing there so that people want to actually protect that. People want to have feelings for it. And so now, let's take a look at this hype perp again, 2022. Web3 is right at the peak of inflated expectations, and NFTs are right about going into the trout of disillusionment. Folks, this is what we call a bear market. That is exactly what that trough means. How long it'll take to move into slope of enlightenment, plateau of productivity? I don't really know, but I have a feeling that better design experience that people have feelings about, that people actually want, is going to get us there a whole lot quicker. So, who remembers this app? Okay, the iBeer. The iBeer was this funny little app that you would download it on your phone and all you could do was pretend to drink a beer, and that was it. Does anyone know, at the peak of this app, how much money it was making per day because of downloads. This app was $2.99. All right, at the peak of downloads, the iBeer app was raking in $20,000 a day. NFTs don't look so weird now, do they, when you look at this comparison? So I would pause it and say, where we are right now, in terms of NFTs and Web3, where design is, where we're understanding the capabilities of how to get people to interact with what we're building here is actually where we are back in the day with the iBeer. There is a lot of time and runway for us as designers to get into the game and understand how to translate these abstract experiences into things that you can actually interact with. So Web3, this is my hypothesis, Web3 is not just about the next internet. My understanding of Web3 is very much that it is the dawn of a cyber physical era where physical assets are coming on chain. This matters in terms of refi, whether you're thinking about card and credits or natural assets. This is also perhaps a little bit around the Internet of Things, but I really, really think about this moment as us looking at the Internet, not as something that's just inside your screen, inside your pocket, but all around us. The cyber physical era that we're about to enter into means that we are trying to understand how to design for a different physics. It's no longer necessarily that this chair is just a chair is just a chair. It may have sensors in it and be able to understand a lot more about you and the availability of a space. Also, I heard this term cyber physical from this developer named Supreme in Oakland. I fell in love with it and I really would like us to move towards cyber physical instead of saying fidgetal. So as designers in the room, can we do that? Like as, a, as an agreement? Yeah, like no more, no more fidgetal. It sounds like a bit of a disease. We're doing cyber physical. It's happening. Okay, here we go. So one of my <clears throat> moments when I was watching The Social Dilemma, which you've seen as a documentary, is it's, it's, it's a good documentary. It's also one of those things that you're like, oh shit, okay, all right, here we go. That's the internet we live in. The thing that stuck out to me the most was when Aza Roskin was introduced and many people were introduced, they had this title underneath, the inventor of the infinite scroll. And some other folks had the inventor of pull down to release. Some other people had the inventor of the like button. And there was this moment in watching this documentary that was like, you know what? I actually just really wanna be the inventor of a new interaction. Like I actually, I actually just want someone to interact with a screen or to interact with something digital in a completely new way. And so this is my invitation for all of us today. We're about to go a little bit more into like workshop interacting mode. Um, and we are going to invent something that perhaps, perhaps becomes the equivalent of something as important as the infinite scroll in Web3. But hopefully, here's my other caveat. I don't really have any screens or stats on this because I just find it depressing. A lot of the interactions that we designed into the Web2 world have had a lot of negative effect on people's emotions. And I would hope that we enter into this phase of designing for cyber physical and as we think about emotional ergonomics to really be careful about the ways that we're designing new user experiences and new user interface because particularly in Web3, this is a space where not only are you looking at social capital, you're also looking at a large amount of financial capital, right? That moment you get a notification because some price went up or down is not just, oh, someone liked my photo. It's also, oh my God, my life savings maybe just went down the toilet. So there's a lot of care and a lot of intentionality, I think, in how we design our new interactions on the internet. So 
Here's our, here's our interactivity piece. If you're really not feeling like socializing, that is A-OK. -okay. You can do this by yourself as well. But highly recommend you get into groups of two or three. If you're sitting by yourself and you don't want to interact with other people, I 100% get it. That is OK. But I'll give you a second. Turn around. Say hello to the person next to you. Give them a name. Turn your chair. Get friendly, whatever you might want to do. It's totally fine if you want to do this solo. I'm all right with it. But for the next 12 minutes, we're going to do this as a little bit of a group activity. So here we go. Okay, two minutes. Two minutes in your groups. I want to know who. Who are the people that will be using your Web3 products? Is it busy mothers, feature phone users, bankers, grandmas, a family that shares a phone? So the whole wallet thing being the only thing that's on your phone and each person has one might not be a thing. Who is your person that you imagine using a Web3 product in your mind? Two minutes, go for it. It can be yourself, but I highly recommend you push out into somebody else. Two minutes and we'll do a little bit of a share back. All right, you got about a minute left. I'm going to do a little bit of crowd work, so don't be scared if I'm coming, if I'm coming towards you. But I want to hear who you're designing for. You got about 20 seconds left. Who is the person that will be using your Web3 product? Are we ready? Here we go. I'm sorry for the cold call. Who is the person? Going with um, like um, folk musicians, like age like 25 to like 40. Folk musicians, age 25, 40, amazing. I can't wait to I can't wait to see like the service that you're thinking of for them. All right, how about here? People involved in small clubs. People involved in small clubs, amazing. Local communities, I love that. All right, how about here in the front? What do we got? Um, independent film directors. Independent film directors. We got a lot of artists in this room. I like this so much. You got one? Uh, no code designers and developers. No code designers and developers. We love that. We love designing for ourselves. Oh, so sorry. Okay, over here. Was that a hand wave over here? Here we go. All right. Low income population to include um, people struggling with mental health and substance abuse. Amazing. Low income populations. Fantastic. Okay, we've got a spread here. So the who is super important. I think it's really crucial that we start with who because just saying that it's anybody doesn't really work, right? The emotional capacity of different users looks very different. The way that they live, the way that they work, the way that they interact with the internet and with their devices is going to look very different. So keep your person in mind. We're gonna do four minutes on why. Why are they using it? What are they trying to do? This might look like sending money back home, might look like sending out a contract, taking out a loan. We're talking about use cases. And it's okay if these use cases aren't quite possible yet. Let's stay in design mode for a little bit. If your developer brain is going like, but, but the Agen layer part of it isn't quite, it's fine. Give me a use case. Think about the use case first. And what is your person actually going to be using Web3 for? Four minutes to think about that. And we'll do a little bit of crowd work, or we might just have you shout it out from the audience. But four minutes, back in your groups. Take a minute. All right, take maybe about two more minutes.
All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander over to see what, uh, what the crowd says. Are you guys ready to share why they're using it? All right. Here we go. Here we go. Why are they using this? Well, first of all, the persona we chose is grandmas. Okay. Um, we were thinking of applications to help grandmas communicate with their grandchildren. We were also thinking of healthcare applications. Um, Grandma Dao also came up. Um, I love it, Grandma Dao. Watch for the, the alpha you heard here, Grandma Dao. But really, health insurance, I think, is one of those things that um, it would be really interesting to design for because you've got privacy, you've got different amounts of digital literacy, you've got different amounts of comfort with screens and devices. Anyone else who's like dying to share their, their use case, their why? If not, I'm gonna move us on. We're running short on time. Okay, what? What are they feeling when they do this? Two minutes on this. How does your person feel while they do this? It's okay if it's a negative feeling. Sometimes you have to design in a little bit of friction. Sometimes what you're doing is intentionally trying to counteract that feeling of something negative. Is it that they're feeling fear? Is it that they're feeling delight? Is it relief? Are they feeling really productive? Is it a little bit of frustration? Take two minutes just to pick the core feeling. There might be a lot of different feelings that your user is going to feel during this moment of interaction, but what is the one core one that feels like the loudest of all of your feelings that you're feeling towards this? Two minutes, take a little bit of time to think about it. Here we go. I'm gonna move us along for time here. Take about one more minute. All right. I'm gonna come on over here. Do we have a feeling for your core user? It could just be one word, the one word feeling that, that you're feeling. Secure. Secure, ooh, we don't hear that a lot when we're talking about financial applications, but yes, I absolutely wanna feel secure when I'm transferring money or doing something else. Okay, we got a hand in the back here. Let me walk all the way over. This is low income households. How are we feeling here? Yeah, so that it feels easy and it's actually a solution that's better than the previous solution. So for our situation that um, they're getting access to mental health services, and to have like their intake process be more graceful and easeful, so to feel easy. Easy, feeling easy, I love that. Feeling a lot smoother, feeling a lot more convenience, feeling like this is something I can do, I can crush this task that I'm trying to do. All right, amazing, so here comes the hardest part and maybe the weirdest, but we're gonna give it a go. You do not have eight minutes because I've only got five minutes left on the time, I'm gonna save a little bit of time for myself, but take four minutes. How does that feeling get embodied? What does easiness feel like? What does security feel like? What does fear maybe even feel like? Take a moment to think about that. Maybe grab your phones, maybe take out your laptops. Think about what that is like with your group. Do a little bit of interaction. Stand up, move around, think beyond the screen. Don't forget about the eye beer and really get into what your physical interaction to express that emotion for your person to do the thing they might do yet. I've really, I really wanted to see someone do like a transfer of money by like drawing a sigil with your phone or like doing something with a magic wand, but how do you go beyond the inside of your phone screen as the only platform for interaction and actually think about your phone as a device that you can use it to control other things. So four minutes on the clock, give it a go. I wanna see your phones out, I wanna see you facing each other, I wanna see you trying stuff out and we'll see what happens. Here we go, a little bit, a little bit more activity for you over here. Get into a little body storming here. What does it look like to use your phone as a wand? 
What does high-fiving your phone screens look like? What if your seed phrase was 12 movements that corresponded to words? Love, love that group over there with their phones out. They're trying to figure out like, how, does, how, does, how, do we, how do you create the feeling of security? What does this look like? Incredible. Okay, I've got <clears throat> two minutes left on the clock, so I'm gonna speed us along a little bit so that we save time for one thing that I wanna do at the end here. But don't forget your interactions. I actually would love to see what you come up with. Because one of the questions that I have here is like, we're very much still thinking about our devices and what is possible right now. But I kind of love this tweet. It was from yesterday, from BCGX. And it's about an AI nose. And I really was thinking about this, like, all right, so smell is one of the deepest senses that we have that's attached to memory. And we keep talking about, you know, how do we help users remember their seed word? How do we help people understand and be able to, like, activate those 12 magical words to recover their wallet? And it just... It just is one of those crazy ideas of like, well, what if your seed phrase was a 12-layered candle that released 12 different fragrances? And those fragrances were things that helped you remember what it might be, what it might unlock. These kinds of interactions maybe are several years off into the future, but these are the ones that are so interesting to me because as we're designing the next wave of the internet, as we're designing the dawn and this era of the cyber-physical, I really don't want to live in a future that is shiny screens, slick interactions, without any kind of embodied feeling, without being able to smell things, without being able to taste things, without being able to, you know, all of the pleasures of being alive and a human and having all of these sensors on our body, I don't want to lose those. And so for all of you here today, thank you so much for spending the time and the energy to think through like, what would interactions with our phone be? But it also pushed you a little bit to think about this concept of a multi-sensorial internet, of how you start to engage all of your different senses and the ways that your body can interact with the real world now in a little bit of cyber physicality. So to sum this all up and to give a little bit of a takeaway here is that toolkits are public goods, right? The moment that Material UI came out, it really allowed a lot of developers and designers to scale up and speed up their process. And they're really, really, really important to scaling new design patterns, which I think all of Web3 is. All of Web3 is an incredibly new design language and design pattern to start to get into. And to be honest, we don't know either what those new design patterns are, and also we don't quite know what those things are embodied as. And so there's more to add than the typical UI kit that we have today at our, um, at our availability in Figma files, because it's like using only a Web2 skin when we've got an entire Web3 body. So I push you to think through, what are actually these new toolkits? What are the public goods that as designers you start to create and you put out into the world so that we're able to scale a delightful design language around Web3, something that really understands and pushes us to think about cyber physicality. And so here's my invitation to you. If you would like to make an emotionally ergonomic interaction design toolkit with me, and uh, we'll figure out the words for that later because it's quite a mouthful. We'll ship it as a public good because public goods are good. And here's what we're going to do. Um, scan this QR code. It will take you to a Telegram group. And then we'll have everybody in one group together. Um, I may throw some design prompts in. We maybe will do some asks for what was the interaction that you came up with. Maybe we'll do a couple of Zoom meetings. Maybe we'll do a couple of just teasers and prompts in there for every from time to time. You can leave an unsubscribe at any time. But I'd really like to know throughout the course of 2023 what we actually end up creating together and what is the toolkit? What is the new thing? I'll come back to this slide in a minute. But how do we go from something that looks like this, which is maybe how a lot of our Web3 applications look like today, truly, they look just like Web2 applications, but what do we end up creating together that starts to embody the internet and starts to give us a feeling of emotional ergonomics? I'm Shuya Gong. You can find me at Shuya at we3.co or on the internet at Oh My Gong. Thank you so much for making stuff with me today. I hope you had a really great time, uh, and I'll see you again in cyberspace.